right, everybody. My next guest is an actor, writer, producer, comedian whose film Tomorrow's Today has just been released to the world and can be seen on Amazon Prime and Apple TV and all over the place. Here he is, the one and only Greg Criticos. Yes. <laughs> How are you doing, Greg? How are you, Don? I got a little scary there. You were like, Greg Criticos. <laughs> It's Labor Day. It's the end of summer. Um, you know, it, it's it's always a bittersweet time. I mean, are you a, are you a fall guy? Do you like the pumpkin spice? Are you into all that kind of stuff? Or you know, it's funny you say that because I'm a sweater. I sweat a lot. You know, so uh, and uh, yeah, I was. You know, if you know a little bit of my story, I, I also lost 185 pounds. I was 385, and I went down to 200 at one point in my life. So. I kind of like the cool weather. You know what I mean? I am a fall person. I've lived in the Northwest when I was touring the country. Right. I, that bad. I mean, I sweat hard, man. I mean, I, when I sweat, I sweat like R. Kelly at a Sweet 16 party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you, man. I always like the fall. I, I like the, the I like the cool seasons, fall and spring. I, I hate the winter, though, man. And uh, But... Um, but, yeah, it's always a, a cool time of year when the seasons start to change, man. That's one of the... the, the the positives of living here in New York and I'm on Long Island. You're still in Astoria? Yes. Yes. I grew up in Astoria. We immigrated to the, uh, to the United States back in 1971. Uh, my father was a, a very uh, well-known famous professional soccer player in Greece. Uh, Athanasios Kritikos. Uh, he uh, played at a, he had bad timing as he called it. You know, he played at a time where they didn't pay you back then. And, uh, right, you know, yeah. And then when they immigrated back in 1971 to Astoria, where he got to see the cosmos, and he was like, "Look at these guys; they get paid for this." You know, uh, <laughs> um, wow! So, so uh, yeah, so you came you came in here to the U S. as a as a young boy, I guess. Uh, yeah, well, you? yeah, uh, yeah, that would be right. A young boy, yes, at seven. I, <laughs> <laughs> these are very uh, trivial questions there. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dom, yeah. I yes, I my father we did it the old fashioned European way, like a lot of people did. Usually uh the parent would come first, work legally, flew here legally with a plane. And, uh, <laughs> he didn't he didn't climb over any walls. <laughs> no, no, he didn't climb any walls, he didn't swim. He right. came over and he started working, saved some money, and then had my uh, mom and sister and myself come in uh, uh about about almost a year later. Wow. So uh we landed in Astoria in 1971, and I've been here ever since. And I love Astoria. Yeah, that's awesome. So, I mean, I, as a young man coming here, was it exciting times? Did you want to go, come to America? And and how you how was it adapting there, like with the language and stuff? Was it was it very challenging, to say the least. Uh, you know, I grew up in a very Irish Italian neighborhood. I was Greek. Uh, you know, back in the 70s, early 70s. You know. If you know anything about New York City, uh, it was very territorial. You know, uh, you weren't accepted. A lot of Greeks in my uh, time, uh, they were moving towards Dittmar. So I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Dittmar. I grew, I grew up right across the street, literally from uh, St. Uh, um, um, Joseph's Catholic Cathedral Church, right on 30th Avenue. So it was a very Irish, Italian, and German neighborhood in my area wow. and uh yeah i couldn't speak a word of uh, english you know uh, my mother used to shave my head funny you know i mispronounced the word hamburger i said hamburger by mistake and i was tagged hamburger <laughs> that was my nickname as a kid and i hated that name man hamburger you know? <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah it was very like but it was challenging to say the least so a lot of i grew up with a lot of fear you know be, be, you know People used to get beat up, man. The 70s were different, man. Yeah, it was different. <laughs> there was a lot of bullying going on, man, but that was the way of life, you know? It it, it was. Like, definitely, when you think back, like, I, I was, I you think back to, I came up in the 70s also. I was born in 71, oddly enough. But 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 that was a different time period where, yeah. and, and I don't, and I'm still on the fence whether or not that time period was better or not. I feel like, I feel like we came out stronger, uh, di different kind of headspace, um, you know. Aside from the, you know, I never like being bullied or or bullies in general. But, but I, I, I think it built, yeah. But I think there there could be in a weird way a positive that comes out of it. it I think it drives you, and uh, if you're you know if you're the one getting bullied, it drives you 
to um outdo them and so yeah know? well yeah absolutely i mean you know uh it gives you uh i mean i wouldn't change the day back you know if i was to go back in time and somebody says would you like to change anything i wouldn't want to change anything you know um you know even playing ball you know when we were kids we used to play in the local schoolyard which was public 70 school ps 70 back then and uh it's funny because you know we used to choose sides when we were kids you know odds and evens Right, and yeah. you know, who got you know they slam on and I said throwing their fingers and slamming on the floor, you know, ah, see, and then and then you got you prayed you got picked because you always do the ones that sucked and they weren't good in sports. <laughs> and I, I don't want them. You take them. I don't yeah, want right. Them. You know? Right, exactly. So, yeah, nobody wanted yeah, to be that guy. Yeah, yeah. They, and, and back then they didn't give trophies for last place. You know, you didn't get a trophy, but like, you know, hey, at, at least you were, you know, you, you you gave an opportunity. You like, you know, okay, you applied yourself to play ball, so here's your trophy. You know, yeah, yeah. Like that, you know, you know, you, you know, you you made an error. Of people were like, oh, you suck. You know, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, and and it strives you to either. Uh, put up or or shut up or you know what I mean you, you yeah. either yeah you, you either fight or flight at that point and I think that builds a certain character that today these kids could just you know complain and cry about it get their participation trophy you know feel like they've d done something when they when they really haven't and, and I, I think that's a a big thing that's missing today uh, with these youth yeah absolutely no doubt about it I think. Uh... You know, and and again, with the addition of all these uh, smart technologies, the internet is way too easier. Back then, you had to go do out, you had to go out and do things. You know, uh, you didn't have everything at the palm of your hands. You know, uh, I was just not too long ago. I was with a buddy of mine, and we were over his house. We were uh, um, discussing movies, uh, writing outlines and stuff like that. And his uh, nephew was there, and his nephew was a little upset. And and his uh, <laughs> he turns on, he asks his nephew, "What's the problem?" And the kid was like. I got kicked out of a group chat. <laughs> <laughs> What's this fucking material for me? This is great shit. I go, you got kicked out of a group chat? And what, what are you going to do? He's like, I'm going to send them an email. I'm going to let them know. I'm like, oh my God, this is hysterical, you know? And back in the day, you know, you know, there was no group chat. You know, they, <laughs> you know you're like, fuck you, you suck it out of here. You know? yeah. <laughs> and you had to swallow it. You had to take it. I'm sorry for cursing. I don't know if you no, that's that's fine. That's fine. So you can speak freely. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. give me a break, man. This kid is like, oh, like I got kicked out of a group chat, man. Like, come on, man. You know, I grew up with guys that were very creative and they were bullies. You know, you played, you know, some of the sports we played was like, I don't know if you guys had him on the island. We played Johnny Ride the Pony. This was a great where like six drunks got together and they made a pony. Like one guy was the pillow up against the wall. The other guy would like just lean into him and hold his waist. <laughs> and, uh, so, and then the team would like run in the air and just try to break the pony. Like you fly in the air, like boom, like, like, until you break the pony. And like, you know, like, like other games, like Mumphrey's where these tough guys would be like, okay, we're going to like have a radius of 10 square boxes. And, and if you leave the box, you know, you're going to get beat up. But inside the box, if you move, you're going to get beat up. If you, it was about getting beat up, man. You know, you're like, what the fuck? You know, but these are the sports that I grew up with, you know? Yeah, uh, those are the... Remember the game of Rover, Red Rover? Do you remember that one? Yeah, you know? yeah, run and yeah. Yeah, they, these guys would like hold on to these chains, make these chains, and they'll be like, Rover, Red Rover, send, send hamburger right over. And I was like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. They're like, send them over, you know? I mean, these are games. Physically, but I wouldn't take. I wouldn't change anything, man. It made me who I am today, and I'm grateful for that. Exactly, man. I, I'm. You know, we had similar games like that. We definitely had Red Rover and, and similar games like like Break the Pony and things. You know, Dodgeball is another one that I think oh, they dodge don't ball. do anymore. Like <laughs> <laughs> Dodgeball, you were dodging for your life. It wasn't about the ball. People are like, let's play dodgeball. People are like head hunting to try to beat you. Yeah, trying to, you know? to get you in the face. Yeah. Yeah, today I guess it's like you know you get kicked out of a group chat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's crazy, man. Now, now when you when you do your stand up and and also uh, when when you write any material, whether it's for stand up or for the movies that you work on, the scripts that you write, um, how much do you pull from from those days and from you know coming here, uh, you know as a, a young uh, kid 
new to the America and, and all the trials and tribulations of that. Do you pull from that at all? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm a creative writer. Uh, you know, creativity is very important to spice things up, whatever you want to do it in any kind of scripts, any kind of movies. Um, as far as my stand-up, it's more like in-your-face, hardcore, black and white, like, you know, reality checks, you know what I mean? I talk about my, you know, my obesity that I struggled with. I talk about, uh, I don't know if you know, I'm sober 11 years. I have no problem breaking my anonymity. Uh, God, you know, I do a lot of motivation, motivational speaking across the country. I have commitments. I have sponsors that I work with and I help them uh, stay sober, which helps me. So all that, you know, there's a recipe to that. And there's a strategy where you come up because people love to listen at other people's pain. They laugh, they identify, you know what I mean? And right, right. so one of the jokes I remember when I was doing, I was headlining at uh, uh, Danger Fields and Tony, the owner was there. And he comes up to me. I said, you know, when you're 385 pounds, it's very hard to take a shower. You can't, the cheeseburger gets wet. <laughs> and Tony came up. To, Tony came up to me at the other. He goes, "Greg, that was brilliant. That was so funny, you know." And I'll say to myself, "He has no idea. It was funny." But when I was at that state of of life, like you know, I was three eighty five. I couldn't take a shower. It was, it was bad. You know, you know, when when you're like three hundred eighty five pounds, man. You know, you know, life changes, man. People are like, can you touch your toes? Can you touch your toes? can't touch your toes. Who cares about touching my toes? I can't find my friend over here. He's in the witness protection program. Definitely, I use a lot of that in my stand-up. As far as writing, you know, uh, Charlie Boy, which I played the role Charlie Boy uh, in Tomorrow's Today, it's a, it's a redemption story. So I did write a little bit. I took a little bit part of my life and I started writing with it. And, uh, and then, uh, lo and behold, uh, three and a half, four years later, it's finally out. And a shout out really quick. I want to, before I, I forget, I want to shout out Benny Rizzuto. Uh, Rizzuto he's the best. Uh, I love uh, Benny. Benny. I love Benny and his wife. You know, amazing. They Nancy. just we contacted Nancy. Thank you, Nancy, for all your nice compliments on, uh, on Charlie Boy. We're getting a tremendous amount of feedback. A lot of people like this movie, man. And it was challenging. You know, I wrote it. I, I, I produced it. I cast all the comics in it, you know. So it was fun, you know, uh, loving what you do. You'll never work a day in your life. I so do look like Tom Hardy. My left ass cheek looks more like Tom Hardy than you do. Charlie Baracus. Oh, Charlie boy. Yo, what's up? All right, let's go. It's like Schindler's List. It never ends. Oh. It's not easy, you know, producing a feature. You know, there's a lot of ups and downs. People get upset. They want more. You know, it, it, it's crazy. And when I first started writing it, I remember working with Sean Young. Uh, I don't know if you know the story. Uh, Sean, you know great person but she ended up taking some laptops from the set and it made world news it was all over the place inside edition has obtained the surveillance video which seems to show sean young and an unidentified man outside the offices of the small film production office you can see them enter the building then the young man walks out with something wrapped up in a sweatshirt Next, they're seen walking out of the building with chairs and a glass table. They load everything into an SUV and drive off. Greg Criticos and Timothy Hines were working with her on the film before they say she was fired. We went down and uh, looked at the footage from the restaurant downstairs, and sure enough, there was Sean and her son taking our computer out. Uh, and that they had broken and entered the apartment, they climbed out onto the roof and went in through the bathroom window uh, to get in and to take this equipment. Yeah. The famous, she was like, right, as wow. a kid growing, growing up and watching her in movies like No Way Out, Dune, yeah. and things like that. So when we yeah. started networking, because I kind of, I brought her aboard on the tape, you know, on Charlie Boy, she was supposed to direct it. Uh, you know, wow. and I contacted her and I said, Sean, how would you feel about directing uh, Charlie Boy back then it was called? And she said, I don't know, Greg, I'll get back to you. And then we were networking already because I'm working on a cartoon, which we'll touch base a little bit. And she said, Greg, you know what? I'll take it. And she flew in and we started networking, talking. And this is Sean Young. As a kid growing up, she was a household name. Very yeah, famous. yeah. And she said to me, Greg, I want you to know one thing about the movie industry. She goes, all the friends that you have now, they're going to be pissed off at you and all, and you're going to make 10 times more friends because of this movie. Everybody's going to want to be in your movie. Everybody's going to contact you and this and that. And the ones that, you know, um, that, you know, didn't get a chance to be in your movie, they're going to be butthurt. 
And I'm a strong believer, the right people for the right place, you know? Right. Because yeah. you're my friend. I can't just throw you in a movie. You know what right. I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's got to make and, sense. And, yeah. and sure enough, there was a couple of incidents that took place. But for the most part, I did give, you know, these guys, some of these uh, comedians that are in the movie, they've never been on the movie before in their whole lives. You know? And I gave them that opportunity. Yeah, I think that's cool. Like, I, 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 I could relate. I just produced a, a shorter film myself. and But I know what you're saying. When you produce a movie and when you, when you do it all yourself, like how you did it, when you write it, produce it, direct it, cast it, I mean, pretty much doing it all yourself. And then you're, you're... I didn't direct it, just so you know. I didn't direct the movie, uh, Charlie Boy. I didn't direct it, you know. Okay. But I produced and wrote it. I wrote the story and everything. Right. So that I just want to just uh, throw up. And really quick, there's three ways of making a movie, what I've learned, Don. First, you got to write it. Then you got to shoot it. And then you have to edit it. There's three different... And so you could fuck up so many different ways. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's thousands of ways of fucking up. But there's only three, <laughs> right? There's only three it's... ways of making it successful. And you got to make sure you write it correctly. Right. Then yeah. you have to shoot it correctly. And then you have to edit it correctly. That's true. And either if you mess up in either of those three states, like if it's if it's if you mess up in the writing stage right from the beginning, it's got flaws. But you could you could re have redemption in the shoot if the acting is great and all that kind of stuff. And and then it's the editor who gets the final kind of say so of how it's going to feel and look and pacing and all that stuff. So all three stages are extremely important um, and and they all complement each other. So it's it is like you said, it is three three stages. And I think you kind of nailed it with um, with tomorrow's today. You know, it, it, it flows really nice. <laughs> Tommy G was looking for you last night. Probably needs more money. That guy can't get his head out of his ass, can he? Well, Bruno, on a few bets. Here's 20. You know, you got a lot of a great cast. Uh, you know, Janice Massetti, who I, I love her, and, and Teddy Smith's in it. Well, um, that, you know, uh, yeah, these are comics that have never been in the movies before. You know, I don't know what they've done, but... Uh, yeah. So, uh, um, Peter Plano. Which he plays the federal agents, a dear friend of mine. Great shot with him, uh, right. Giovanni. He's also on Blue on uh, Boardwalk Empire. Nikki yeah. Sunshine. I put her in the movie. Great acting. These are great actors. You know, uh, I, I was really impressed with a lot of the performances from these uh, three actors. You know. Oh uh, yeah. You know, uh, really amazing. Nikki, especially Nikki Sunshine, but Giovanni. Um, I forget his last name, but you know, he's all over the place on social media. Uh, um, and, uh, yeah, so it was fun to cast them, you know, and, and all that, but now I'm working with some other producers as well. And I promised myself this time around, I'm going to take a step back from that. I don't want to, uh, you know, it's, it's too much, man, too much. Everybody wants to like, you know, be in a movie. They want to do that. And, and they don't get it because a lot of people, especially actors, you know, they, I've heard in, in this industry, one of the worst things an actor could do is invite another actor to an audition, and then he doesn't get the role, and then right. the other guy and yeah. then the three <laughs> I hear that all the time. Yeah, that happens. You know? Yeah, that's crazy. So, yeah. Right. So now that I'm working, uh, I'm in a, um, another project that I'm actually, I just got done writing the second act, and I'm working with these amazing producers, man. The James and Teddy oftenest. They have a whole TV series out there called A Good Cop. I think you'd make a good cop. No, I would not. I just applied to join the NYPD. Wait, why? Uh, and uh, we're actually working on something, and um, it's another lead role for me. And uh, if all goes well, in March, we'll be in principal photography. I'm starring in it again. And, uh, you know, just sitting back and just being more in front of the camera, you know, which will yeah. help with the production, it's, it's going to be my next goal in the next feature. I don't want to be hands-on more, you know, just relax and just play the character, which I'm really looking forward to in this next character. I'm planning on losing a lot more weight, shake, you know. It's going to be fun. I can't wait to, like, it's gonna, just really quick, it's going to be called, the name of the movie is called Crooked. Ah, oh, nice. <laughs> That's so, awesome. Uh, yeah, man, but, but yeah, yeah. So my life experiences... I definitely throw them in any kind of like experience, you know, things that I'm creative that I'm producing and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's fun. You know, it is, it's really fun. So, and along with creativity, obviously, you know? Yeah. You definitely, um, 
creative. I mean, uh, uh, and you're finding the outlets, whether it's the writing, acting, stand up, it, it's getting it all, it all out. And, that, and that's, you know, when creative people, they're going to do it, whether they got to do it themselves or, <laughs> or, if they, or if they get, um, you know, somebody to do it with them. I had big opportunities in the uh, late eighties, uh, early nineties, uh, Don, honestly. And, uh, I came up with a, a couple of famous comics now, uh, and, um, you know, and I, uh, you know, my alcoholism, whatever you want to call it, was taken away from me, you know. So I had opportunities with Comedy Central. They were knocking on my door. I used to come home, and back then, you know, Comedy Central would call. My mother was like, what is this Comedy Central? What, what is this? They keep calling you. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll call them back, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had other opportunities to be in The Sopranos as well. But, you know. Again, my drinking and drugging had taken over my life, and I was unable. So I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be right now. Yeah, I think, like you know, uh, and God bless you, man, for for you know getting through that because I think your story is inspiring to be able to uh -huh. um, kind of fight off those demons in your life, whether it's the depression, alcoholism, addiction, um, and to overcome that is an inspiration to so many people that might be going through that right now. And I think it's important for people to know your story and to know you know that that there is hope and that there is a light and and tell take me a little bit through that um when did you know that you had a problem and then when how did you fix it you know uh i was recently uh interviewed uh ellen Karras on her corner podcast and i touched base on something that was pretty emotional but let me give you an idea um you know in 1994, my son was born, and I remember that day, you know, uh, my wife was at uh, Flushing Hospital giving birth to my son, and I'm shaving, and I'm in front of the mirror, and I got a crack pipe in my pocket, and I got a, a, a fifth of doors in front of the bathroom. My wife is at the hospital. My sister is there. You know, my mom was a handicap. My mom, you know, God rest her soul, she passed away in September. Uh, it's going to be one year uh, coming up in September oh. that's passed. You know, and I lost my dad. Thank you. And I lost my dad in 2020, Don. Oh, God so, bless, man. Thank you. Yes. So it's like, here I am, and I'm looking at myself, and tears are running down my face. And I realized, I said, holy shit, I got a problem, man. That's the first time that I kind of looked at myself and said, I didn't get sober. Now, get this. From 94... When my son was born that day, I remember like it was yesterday. I didn't get sober until 2011. All right, yeah. So to give you an idea how long my bottom was, you know, I had a very, very bad bottom. I lost everything. I was 385 pounds. I was homeless and, you know, drinking and drugging, you know. I, and again, and, and when I throw it in comedy and I tell people I – I, I was the fattest crackhead in New York City. They eat that up. They die <laughs> laughing. You know, it's hysterical, you know? Yeah, I was... The, and then I'll throw in the punchline. I was the fattest, but fastest crackhead in New York City because when you're on crack, you move fast. So, yeah, that was the point in my life that is behind me. Um, I do... When I do my motivational stuff and, you know, I speak to people and... Uh, I have commitments that I work with organizations that I don't get paid for, which I love giving back, giving away. But there's other uh, times where I do get hired for that. And I go back into those images of my life. It's, you know, it's exactly what other people need to hear. Because if I can change, anybody can change. But you got to want it. You know what I'm saying? You have to want it. A lot of people, they'll, you know, people say, oh, he needs or she needs to get sober. That person isn't going to get sober until they want it. You have to want it. Yeah, I think it's all it's it, it does all come down to uh, mental. You you need to to change your thinking to some degree. I would think, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, most of the time, a lot of people have given up in life, you know, and they've surrendered and they said, "The hell with it." You know, I know I wanted to die. I didn't want to die, but for some reason, you know, the universe. I choose to call God. I'm a spiritual person. He kept me alive. Uh, I really believe he kept me alive for moments like this right now. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and, and you know, I'm living my life, man. I, I'm on a drug called high, you know, a life. You know, I'm fucking like, you know, I mean, I, I tour the country. I get paid for something I love. I help many people as I possibly can. Uh, to me, helping somebody is the most is important. That's key, you know. I mean, 
I've had situations where I was in a lineup and I was the headliner in a lineup of comics and I got a call from somebody and they said, Greg, you know, uh, can you help us with a situation? And I called the producer and I said, listen, I'm not going to be able to make it, man. And he was like, okay, Greg, no worries. You know, I'll get somebody else. Now, obviously, if it was a one-man show and I had obligations and everybody's coming out to see me now and I'm the only comedian, I can't do that. But in a situation like that, I got off the show and I went and I took care of what I had to take care of because it's all about helping another person. Right on, man. And I, I think it's super commendable what you're doing. But um, take me back to, to 2011 when... Um, 2011, oh. my best friend, um, he kind of like came up to me and he said, Greg, man, you need help. Uh, you need help. And uh, and I I had surrendered already. I, I knew that I needed help, you know. Um, I didn't know how. I was stuck in mud, you know. I was this sailboat sailing across the ocean with beautiful sails, the sun was, you know, shining, I'm flying across the universe, whatever. And then at one point, my sails are broken. You know, I'm in a very dark, cold ocean. I'm just floating there dead. You know, I was just a walking corpse. You know, I had hit my bottom. And, uh, you know, and I needed this person to come to me, which was my best friend. And he said to me, Greg, I'd rather kill you myself than watch you kill yourself slowly, man. So uh, he said, I'm going to pick you up on Monday morning and I'm going to bring you right to uh, Phoenix house, the office. And a part of me was relieved. Uh, it was Friday when he spoke to me and I kid you not Monday morning. So the first moment I was so happy that I knew that in two days, I'm going to go do something about it. But in my mind in the attic, mind, I was like, cool. I got Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to get high. Right, you know right. I mean? <laughs> That's where the mind, it's a fucked up disease. <laughs> and you know, and and then sure enough, I partied hardy that weekend. And then he came, he drove me. And I remember walking into the headquarters in Phoenix house. And they asked me, they said, hey, what's your choice of drug? And, you know, I was like, well, I drink a little bit. I might sniff a little bit. You know, I might smoke a little bit. Meanwhile, I'm drinking a fifth of doors. I'm smoking crack. I'm sniffing my my ass off and and the lady said to me i'll never forget this she says well tell me do you do coke without alcohol i go never i have to be drunk before i do that they said congratulations you're an alcoholic and uh i was like wow okay and then uh they they said uh stick around go outside you know whoever you're with i went outside i told my friend they said we're gonna need you we're gonna need you to go to detox and a lot of people don't know about this but in order to go to detox you have to be drinking so i go to my buddy i go listen they're gonna pick me up and drive me to the hospital but i have to get drunk he was like what are you serious <laughs> i go no i'm serious he goes are you fucking because he knows i'm a good storyteller i can bullshit my way out of fucking i can tell ice to an eskimo you know i i said no man i go that's exactly what they said they said greg i'll check up on you good luck he gave me a hug. I love this guy to death. He's my best friend. He said, and I went to the bar and I got the call. They said, your ride is outside. I had a couple of drinks. And it was like, uh, you know, I told the bartender, here you go, man. Going to get sober. And he looked at me like, what? <laughs> got in the car. <laughs> I went to East Rockaway. I spent seven days in East Rockaway. I had the shakes. They put me on Librium. And uh, it was just me and my disease. And, you know, when the smoke cleared, I was looking at myself and I had no fucking clue who I was. I didn't know. I was 48 years old. You know, changing your life around at 48 is not easy. And, uh, well, you know, I'm not saying it can't be done, but I was 385 pounds. I smelled bad. I, I was taking showers. I was through depression, really bad depression, you know, and... I went in, I remember the woman coming in and I was sweating so bad that you could smell the alcohol coming out of my pores. And at one point she's like, you have, you have liquor in here? I was like, no, how do I have liquor in here, you know? And I used to sit on chairs taking showers because my back, my my frame at 5'8", being 385 pounds was a lot of pressure on my body. Right, yeah. And, uh, you know, since I've gotten sober and I lost all that weight, I have other damages I've had two carpal tunnel surgeries. I've had neck surgery. This hurt. This herniated three, four, five, and six. Wow. Okay, just not too long ago, about five years ago, I had that. Uh, I had a hip replacement on my left hip, and I recently had orthoscopic knee surgery. So, you know, to give you an idea, what that means is like, you know, if you're like, picture a spring, 
and you have all this weight on the spring. Now, when the weight, you lose all that weight, you know what happens? Yeah. The spring, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and like, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of damage to my body, you know what I'm saying? But thank wow. God the, the brain is still here, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, the brain is the, the most important muscle. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, thank uh, God. Yeah, but, you know, it was a scary moment, you know, just when the smoke cleared, it was me looking into the mirror. I had no clue who the fuck I was. Yeah, that, that that's a that's a that's rough, man, to 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 be in that dark place. And uh, thank God you had a friend who could help you get you out of there. W- throughout those years, were you still working, like doing comedy, or were you just kind of like no, no, to the world? Uh, as a kid, I always loved the, the the creative arts. As a kid, uh, you know, I can still hear the first joke I said when I was like seven years old. Uh, uh, actually, it was I was still in Greece. I was like six, five. I was on a bus. And I can still hear the laughter. I don't know if that means anything to you. You know, I can still hear that first, that explosion of laughter. I was on a bus and my mom was like, be a good boy. Like, I was too rowdy. I was very, very hyper when I was a kid, you know. And she's yelling at me, tell me, be a good boy. You're just a little boy. And across the bus, I see somebody being very loud. And I look at her and I go, he's a little boy. Why don't you yell at him? And he was a little person. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, and and the bus exploded. People were laughing. They were like, oh my God, my mother was like, Shh, be quiet, oh my God. You know? So that was one of the first explosions I got here in laughter. And then the first time I actually walked on stage, first time in my life, it was 2011 when I got sober. It's like I got sober, I was homeless, everything was bad. And then I went on stage. And I was uh, at a uh, New York comedy club, the old comedy club. I uh, they were looking for talent, or whatever. And I remember the first joke I ever said when I got on stage. I had a hat on and glasses. I didn't want to. And, and the producer came up to me. He goes, "Hey, he goes, uh, what's up?" I go, "What's up?" He said, uh, "Why are you wearing a hat, and glasses? I, go, I don't want people. I feel funny. People are seeing me." He's like, "With that voice, I don't think they're gonna, they're gonna know you." <laughs> and I was on a show with Clayton Fletcher. It was a Friday night, and I remember um, getting on stage. And the first joke I said is like, "I want to thank everybody for coming on stage." And I went, "Whoops." I'm on stage, you're over there. And people left. And from there, I just went on, improv the whole thing, believe it or not. I had uh, no plans. Yeah. This woman kept asking me, Greg, I can get you a set. You're pretty funny, she said to me at the bar. You're pretty funny. You're pretty funny. While I'm getting high. And then when I got sober, I went back to the bar. And she said, I think I can get you on stage. I was like, really? I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And then she, she was desperately trying to get me on stage. And this person came into my life, got me on stage. And then at the end of the show, I remember being on stage and I had my glasses on and Clayton's giving me the light at the, at the back of the thing, whatever. And right, yeah. He got on stage and he said, hey, you little boy. And he got like five, six, and he put me on check time. I don't know if you know what check time is. Check time, you know, is, yeah, uh, when they deliver the check. gets the check. Yeah. So when he said to me, he said, listen, I, this is the first time you ever got on getting on a show. I'm going to have to put you on check time. I was like, I don't, I don't know what check time was. Anyway, so he comes up to me at the end of the show. He goes, wow, that was your first time ever on stage? I said, yeah. He goes, wow, that was impressive. He goes, you're going places. I go, I sure am. I'm going back to a story. And, uh, <laughs> and, and from there, I uh, went back and, uh, you know, I stayed sober. And I started all that creativity that I had for years started coming out of me now. And I started writing. And, and then I did something that made it on national TV in Greece called Stories from Astoria. I wrote it, and I've been working on that for a long time. It's my baby, you know? That's cool. And we actually uh, shot a sizzle reel, um, and it was uh, it made on national TV in, in Greece. I got a tremendous amount of calls for that, and uh, called Stories from Astoria. So, yeah, I guess 2011, you know, when I got sober, my creativity just started coming out. And that's when it all started, pretty much. That's yeah. when you were reborn. Yeah, yeah, it was like this whole brand new person. And, you know, I really loved it. And writing, picking up the pen, writing sketches, doing things. You know, uh, Ben and I, Roosevelt, have a sketch out that I think all together were close to like maybe 15 million views uh, called The Slice. I don't know if you ever got a chance to see it. It's uh, it's an annoying hipster. He comes on. Uh, <laughs> I think I did see some of those. Yeah. With the, 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 the Slice. Organic chicken barbecue slice, bad handcrafted small batch crust, thanks. What? We don't do none of that stuff here, kid. But the Yelp review said that... I don't do Welp. I don't do none of that stuff. That was uh, across the street, Greg G's with two G's, okay? 
uh, since that gluten-free, crust-free range, range, whatever that stuff is, went out, there's only one Greg with one G, and that's me, because I'm an old G. Now, what do you want? Yeah, um, and that, you know, so sketch comedy is a big part. I love sketch comedy, you know, just uh, something really funny, you know. Yeah, big yeah, fan yeah. of comedy for years as a kid, growing up and watching the original cast of SNL, you know. I mean, it was beautiful. So, yeah, I get to do things that I really, really love today, you know. Well, like I like I said, like um, I love the the, the movies that you make in the, your your stand up that I've seen, um, you know, on YouTube and stuff like that. Everybody should go check those out. Uh, uh, and you are an inspiration for for what you've done. Even at at the at age forty eight, you, you're proving to people that it's not too late to make a change. You're living proof of it. You look great. You look terrific. You uh, you, you know, you're in great shape. Uh, you're funny. You're you're at the you're pe you're haven't peaked yet. You're still going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I got sober at forty eight. I, uh, you know, I, I left. I blew the geographic. I went to, uh, to to the northwest. I actually moved out there because I I was sick and tired of New York City. And I had met somebody on Facebook. I didn't even know what Facebook was. You know, I got a lot of jokes on like you know, you know, even like, you know, when I heard of Instagram automatically as an addict. You know, I thought of the two words, Insta and Gram. I was like, well, then now they delivered cocaine instantly. You know, Instagram. I was like, oh. right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and selfie, all these selfies, you know, um, which I used it in my, incorporated my comedy. I go, selfie for me, back in the day, was when my wife wouldn't, wasn't putting out. That was the selfie. You know? So I incorporate all this shit, you know, in my, so when I got sober, I didn't know about Facebook. I didn't know about it. none of this shit. You know what right. I'm saying? I didn't know what an email was. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, I, I left. I went, to, you know, here I am on Facebook. Somebody set it up for me, and I'm talking to this blonde, and she's like, hey, handsome. She would, like, call me handsome, whatever. We'll talk back and forth. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, how you doing? And I'm going on her wall, and I'm giving her my number. I'm like, you can call me whenever you want. She's like, don't. Put it on the wall. Use the inbox. I didn't know what the inbox was, you know what <laughs> And and she's like, let's get together. I was like, I'd love to get together. She's like, I'm I'm in, I'm in Spokane. I was like, what part of Jersey is that? I'd love to come out. She's like, Jersey. She goes, you really are a comedian. I was like, no, I didn't know. She's like, I'm in Washington State, man. I was like, what? What? Yeah, like, that's like next to Montana. I was like, yeah. so I decided to go out there, and for a week we got to know each other. It was pretty cool. And then I came back and I decided to move out there. And I actually packed up and I pulled the geographic. I lived out in the Northwest where I got to meet a lot of people. I've done the Bing Crosby Theater a couple of times out there already. You know, wow, I, yeah. I did a show at the Bing. I, I done shows in Portland, Oregon, the Helium Club. I done shows in Idaho. I've done a lot of shows out there. But the most important thing was that I wanted to tell you is that when I was out there, everybody thought I was in the witness protection program. <laughs> Can't make this shit up. That's so, freaking great, man. You know, so, so I started writing an idea and I came up with the Witless Protection Program. Right, yeah. So I started writing about a Greek gangster that got thrown out of a plane by crooked feds out in Idaho called the Witless Protection Program. And here I am. I put it together. And um, I think on social media, we have the old version. But now we've, you know, thanks to the EPK, you got to see the new version. Right. And I started working with Mike Rockwitz, which is he's my editor and he's also my graphics designer. Uh, Mikey's the youngest editor to work uh, with Stan Lee in Marvel Comics. He's, uh, you know, so him and I formed uh, Legendary Entertainment in New York City. So he does all my graphics. We have a show called Views, News and Reviews on social media podcast. But I pitched to them. I said, hey, man, I said, check this out. So him and I, we came up. You know, I, I I had come up with all the creative, all the characters. It was pretty cool. We got funded for three episodes. We put it together, and we actually hired Will Branker for Rent and Stimpy. Oh, damn, yeah, that's huge. Yeah, so we actually put an executive summary report. I don't know if you have clips of it, if you're going to show it, or if you're not. I don't I'll, know. I'll definitely like, put some clips in. Just be cool. Astrid is sweet, but she's a little odd. Great. I'm trying to stay safe and clear my name. And I got a crazy old cat lady that I gotta be okay with. You know, people in the Northwest, I, for some reason, I guess, you know, maybe the witless uh, protection uh, 
you know, strategy is sending a lot of people from New York, East Coast, whatever, to the Northwest and hide them out. And it's funny because, you know, my voice, I'm a character right off the top. I'm very animated. I've actually had people in the Northwest come up to me and said, this woman, I'll never forget this, hysterical. She's like, hey, hi, how are you? are a New Yorker? I was like, yeah, I'm a New Yorker, you know? Because <laughs> they emphasized on the R's a lot out there, the R's. Right. They're like, welcome to Washington. I'm like, there's no R in Washington, lady, you know, Washington. <laughs> like, hey, hey, kids, come here. Look, a real New York gangster. Look, come here. And I'm like, what the fuck is this lady? You know, it's insane. But yeah, so when I was out there, people thought I was in a witness protection program. And it kind of got me going. I started using it as, you know, on my stand up. And I talk about how, like, you know, I was out there huckleberry picking. In Idaho, they go huckleberry picking, which is fucking hysterical. You know, they pick the berries, then the bears pick them, you know? And I had this stuff where I had my friends call me. They're like, hey, bro, what's up? I'm like, hey, what's going on? They're like, where you at, Greg? I'm like, I'm in Washington State, bro. They're like, cool. Did you visit the White House? I was like, dude, that's DC, man. You know, I was like, I, I'm not, no, you're not. Well, I go, it's closed. I go, no, bro, I'm next to Montana, bro. You have any idea? Like, you know, they're like, holy shit, what are you doing out there? I'm like, I'm Huckleberry picking. And uh, they're like, don't ever come back to Brooklyn. When you come back to Brooklyn, we're going to break your fucking legs. <laughs> huckleberry picking. Picking what yeah, exactly they, they is a Huckleberry? That. What's a Huckleberry? It's a berry. It's a very expensive berry. It tastes good. So they go into the uh, woods out there and they pick berries, it's, which is hysterical. Huckleberries are a delicious berry that you find in the woods. They're loaded in vitamin C and other antioxidants. And if you come across a bush like this, make sure you stop by to give them a try. It tastes like strawberry nerds. I was out there with a friend of mine, dear friend of mine, William Bassan, uh, Bill. Um, and uh, he produced my last show, last couple of shows that I was out there. It's really funny. So he actually took me, uh, uh, we went to put up no trespassing signs in this area that uh, it was kind of weird. I kept going down and down and, and trees and shit. It was fucking weird. It's crazy. And I'm going down there and I'm looking at, and, and I'm like, something's wrong here, man. You know, like, what the fuck? Like, and he's like, ah, don't worry about it. Just keep going down, down, you know. And now trees are getting higher and higher. And I'm, and I'm in there. I'm looking at him. He's got all these these boots that are strapped up all the way to the bottom of his kneecap. They got claws on the bottom. And I'm in there with my Air Jordans. <laughs> and I, I'm like, yo, the, you know. And I was like, yo, there's something wrong here. He's like, nah, don't worry about it. He goes, I got to go across the creek. He goes, why don't you hang out here one second? I'll be right back. And he gives me this knife, and it's fucking dull. He gives me a dull knife. Meanwhile, I'm looking at the, the tree bark, and it's like, I go, what are those? He goes, oh, those are bear marks. I go, bear marks? <laughs> and he's like, I'll be right back. And he's like, he gives me a dull knife. I couldn't even fucking make a, a spear or something. I couldn't even fucking. Here I am. I'm hitting the fucking branch. I'm like, what the fuck? You know? And, and. And then I look at him, he comes back. I'm like, listen, we got to get out of here. He's like, I don't worry about it. I go, dude, you bring me down into this fucking valley, wherever it is. It was called the canyon. Down into this canyon with trees. <laughs> I go, I go, yeah, you've got these boots that you could claw your way out of anyway. I got their Jordans. He goes, yeah. I go, ah, something's not right here. He goes, yeah, don't you know what they say around here? I was like, what? He goes, always bring a fat, slower person with you when you go into a canyon. <laughs> yeah, the I was like, oh, really? I go, and I smell peanut butter jelly sandwiches on my backpack, you fuck. He goes, hey, <laughs> so I, you can't make this shit up. So I got to meet Bill. Bill's a great guy out there. And I've been back to the Northwest. To, you know, I've done a couple of shows. I just recently got back from Metalene Falls, which is 12 miles from the Canadian border. I did the show house out there. Great show. So, but that was my experience. So when I went out there with William, I, I lived there for six months. I was actually staying in his house and I was living out there, touring with this woman. They thought I was in a witness protection program and I ended up writing the witness protection program. And when I got back to New York, I hooked up with Mike Rockwitz and uh, he uh, got his Will Branca. And uh, now we have something called the Witness Protection Program. And we have an executive zone report. And we're, that's going to be a future project that we're really looking forward to, like, kicking off in 2024. I don't really care that this is a Cap County. We need more booze. Greg, we got a problem. Hold on a minute. I'm trying to fix our liquor problem. Wow, that's awesome, man. You got, uh, you got a lot of irons in the fire, man. A lot of projects cooking. Uh, yeah, yeah. Must, must yeah. be exciting times, man. 
Yeah, it is, man. And, um, you know, September 24th, you're invited if you want to come. We're doing the, sto uh, the meth. I sent you a poster of that. Yeah, the meth. yeah. It's a story, storytelling show, which uh, people can, anybody could go and drop their name in a hat and they get a chance to tell their story uh, for seven minutes on stage. Whatever, it, we, uh, I, we have a, a theater booked closed in there. I'm doing it with... Uh, a couple of producers, a couple of friends of mine, uh, Theodore Angelis, uh, Tara Sedga. Mike's going to be a uh, uh, judge. We're going to have storytellers. We're going to have judges. It's pretty cool, man. And I'm excited about that show. Um, yeah, September 24th. Yeah, so September. storytelling, you know, a lot of storytellers are coming to the show. Movie make people that are like, you know, they like filmmakers and stuff like that. September 24th, the meth. Everybody's got to come out and, and see that man that's that oh, should man. be really and cool to see yeah, yeah yeah if you go on my page uh greg critical so the meth t-h-e m-e-t-h the meth is gonna be on, on there so that's a, a show that i produced and uh and uh my stand-up as usual but a lot of projects you know like you said we're working on a, a lot of projects and uh i'm excited man awesome man and now uh before I, I, I let you go here, I have this uh, thing called uh, Don's Random Questions. Uh, who is the funniest comedian of all time? Um, me, I grew up loving, uh, uh, well, George Carlin. Everybody goes with George Carlin. <laughs> but uh, to me, I got to go with uh, Jackie Gleason. There's no way, no way that you could come from my loins. Richard Jenny. These are the sensitive liberal people who are always yelling about everybody's freedom of speech and expression. Unless you happen to say something that pisses them off. But I think the funniest laughing person, I think Jackie Gleason. I saw that, you son of a bitch! You did that on purpose! You go to wait till you agree! I got the evidence. Put the evidence in the car. Awesome. What's the best comedy movie ever? I, I love Caddyshack. Excellent, great answer. <clears throat> it looks like I'm a wreck. It's in the hole! It's in the hole! Is it better to be loved or feared? <laughs> You're talking to a gangster, ex-gangster. Uh, yeah, loved, loved. Because love conquers everything. You know, fear is just false evidence appearing real. That's all fear is. And I think, uh, you know, when you love things and, you know, things happen in a positive way, uh, you know, fear is just, you know, too many people just accept fear and it stops them from doing anything. When you have love in your life, you know, a lot of things grow. So I'd rather be loved than fear. Um, what is your go-to karaoke song? <laughs> That's life. Man, uh, that's why. Who is the most famous person you ever met? Well, you know, I mean, he's an actor. I'd say Bert Young. I love Bert. Bert's a great guy, man. Him and I uh, spoke on set. So in person, Bert's the most uh, famous person I met was Bert Young. Hey, what is it? What is it? You know me like a book, don't you? Uh, if you had a time machine, would you go back in time or into the future? Future. Hopefully the future is bright, right? <laughs> um, hey, listen, I've always been uh, that kid that always expands on the horizon. You know, I want to learn more, see more, you know what I mean? Excellent. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. And um, finally, what's the best advice you have for, for people who who are coming up in this world and want, and want to be successful? I think the most uh, important thing is to know who we are, to live life and to find out who we truly are. I think the two most important days in our life is the day we're born and the day we come to an understanding, you know, what, you know, what our goal, you know, what our purpose is in life. And I think you can't do that without finding yourself, you know, uh, finding yourself, taking a good look at yourself and, and not let anybody rent space in your head, man. You know, go after your dreams. Never let a, you know, uh, people that don't believe in other people's dreams are, are usually the ones that failed at theirs. You know, just keep striving, keep moving forward. 
And any, anything is achievable, as long as you want it. You have to want it and love it. And uh, my advice to you, is, to anybody out there, is like, you know, we're all put on this planet for a purpose. And, uh, you know, just keep striving and keep moving forward in life. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, man. Uh, this was this was great uh, talking to you and getting to know you a little bit here, Greg. You are a uh, definitely inspiring guy, very super talented guy, hilarious guy. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and just uh, tell everybody where they could find you and follow you and all that good stuff. Yeah, Don, it was a pleasure to speak with you, obviously, and uh, you know I hope to meet you in person one day uh, soon in the near future. Yeah. You can find me in Greg Criticos, G R E G K R I T I K O S on Instagram. Uh, um, on on Facebook, I'm all over the place. Greg Criticos, or my uh, given name, which is Gregorius Criticos, G R I G O R I O S. Last name is Criticos, as usual. So, Greg Criticos on Instagram, on Facebook, you can find me on, on social media. And, uh, you know, I do the TikTok too. Go to see my TikTok videos. And everybody out there, if you want to see a very funny video, Google. The Slice, Greg the Greek. Uh, take a look at it. It's pretty funny. And uh, it's an annoying hipster trying to change pizza. Uh, pizza. So uh, if you want to get a kick out of like these annoying hipsters trying to change pizza and an old timer like myself <laughs> telling them exactly to go fuck off, you're going to love this video. And I think, like I said, we're close to like 15 million views now. My pizzeria has been around before your dad's dysfunctional sperm knocked up your politically correct mother. Now, here's your fucking slice. That's awesome, man. Sir, Greg, thank you so much, man. You're the best, and I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to sharing the stage with you one day. Hopefully that'll happen also. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs>